And while he was being held by these guys, young men holding these big rifles on him, they would ask him questions like, uh, do you think American girls would find me attractive? And they would uh, relax and take a break and still holding the gun on him and play Michael Jackson records. They were absolutely tied into American pop culture, but it did not stop them from waging jihad at the same time. Very interesting. Thank you. Salam. I'm a theology student at the University of Cambridge with specialism in Judaism and Islam. My question is mainly about women's rights. You were talking about the um, discrimination against women in the Quran. There's um, an increasing number of scholars, um, Karam, in, about Islam in, Islamins and um, feminisms in Egypt, and Munira Fakhr in the Gulf, discussing that Islam is actually egalitarian at its heart, but that it's men that are destroying Islam for women. I was wondering what you thought about this position. Well, I hope they convince everybody in the Muslim world, but I don't have much hope of that. Uh, as you well know, I'm sure, uh, on Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran, in verse 34, says, good women are obedient. As for those who are not, skipping ahead a little bit, as for those who are not, uh, give them a warning, send them to separate beds, and beat them. Now, the, uh, the clause, uh, beat them, in Arabic, has been recently translated as send them away. Uh, unfortunately, every, without exception, every uh, translation of the Quran into English, by Muslims and by non-Muslims, every last one up until this new translation has beat them, or some variant thereof, scourge them, whatever. And obviously, Muslim men take that seriously as a mandate, since it is a topic of great discussion in various Islamic forums and Islamic television shows in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere as to, well, how, when exactly can you beat your wife, and how hard, and with what implement, and so on. And so it's, it's, it's something that's, uh, you know, spousal abuse takes place in all cultures, but only in Islam does it have divine sanction. I appreciate an effort to mitigate that. I certainly applaud it. But uh, the problem is if it advances under false pretenses by pretending that the verse says something other than what it says, or pretending that Islam is egalitarian when the Quran says very plainly in the same passage that men are superior to women and are above them in authority, then I don't think it has much chance of convincing many Muslims because they know what the Quran says. And that's, the, that's where the problem lies. It's easy to convince non-Muslims who don't know anything about Islam that Islam is egalitarian and peaceful and tolerant and wonderful. It's a lot harder to convince the Muslims who are acting as if it isn't that those things are so. Thank you. Jordan Harms from uh, Rhodes College. And firstly, thank you very much for taking the time to come out and speak to us. Um, my question was regarding um, the, whether radical Islam is a political or a religious ideology. The reason I'm asking this is because that uh, at my college, one of the things we studied when we took a Western uh, history and philosophy class was the Quran. We studied the spread of Islam. And we read uh, different verses of the Quran, and we read verses that both preached violence and preached tolerance, paradoxically, at the same time. And I was wondering, um, what were your thoughts if it is a political ideology? By that, I mean that um, we have people like uh, bin Laden, Zarqawi, um, ha Al-Qaeda, Hamas, other terrorist groups that teach, uh, that uh, sort of twist the words of the Quran and give it to the general populace as fact. And I just wanted to know if you consider it to be political more than religious. Uh, Islam is both a political and religious ideology, and it always has been. As a matter of fact, it's very telling that the uh, calendar year one in the Islamic calendar is not the year that Muhammad became a prophet, not the year that he was born, not the year that he was died, not anything you might expect, but only that when oh, it is when Islam became a state, when Islam became a political polity, and Muhammad became a military and political leader, that's year one of Islam. And I think that's very telling. The, Islam, uh, the, the Islamic state up until 1924 was always considered to be an essential element of Islam in the world. And Islamic polemicists and apologists throughout history have criticized the West for the sacred secular distinction and have said that Islam has a comprehensive unity, and that unity is manifested in the fact that it's political as well as religious. So taking them at their word, I would say it's both. Now, as far as the peaceful and tolerant verses of the Quran go, 
Here again, I would say the best way to understand that is to go to the Islamic sources. And if you go to Ibn Ishaq, for example, Muhammad's first biographer, he explains that the Quran has three stages of development in its teachings on unbelievers and warfare. The first is tolerance, the second is defensive warfare, and the third is offensive warfare to impose the law of Islam. Now that's Ibn Ishaq in the 8th century. And he's saying that the offensive warfare is the final stage and it supersedes the other two stages. So that there are tolerant passages in the Quran, but they no longer have applicable force for Muslims. The offensive warfare passages do. That's not me talking. See, here, here is the key distinction. Is that Islamophobia to say that? Is that hate speech? Well, actually, it's Ibn Ishaq, a 9th century Islamic scholar, and Muhammad's first biographer. And 8th century, excuse me. And the, every school of Islamic law, current in the world today, teaches the same thing. And so when you say that al-Qaeda and Hamas twist and hijack Islam, I, I have not been able to substantiate that claim by anything that I see in Islamic teaching. I don't see any school of jurisprudence that does not teach warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation. I don't see any sect of Islam that does not teach warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation, except for the Ahmadiyya, who are considered heretics for precisely that reason. And I, don't, I see all these Islamic scholars throughout history saying the violent passages supersede the tolerant ones. And so when I see Osama bin Laden and Hamas saying we're the true Muslims and the pure Muslims, I, it's up to the Muslims ultimately to decide the question of who are the true and pure Muslims. But they certainly have a case that convinces many Muslims of the rightness of their cause. And this is the great difficulty that we have. And here again, I don't think that pretending it's anything otherwise or... Uh, trying to sugarcoat the reality is going to get us anywhere. We have to start with reality and formulate policy accordingly. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Victor Slash, Penn State University. And uh, first off, thank you for being here. And my question is, why is the administration acting cowardly and refusing to acknowledge this threat for what it is? Because if they haven't noticed, and this is quite possible, that this is the United States, <coughs> and we have the uh, resources to handle any threat that comes our way. Well, Barack Obama, from the evidence of his speech to the Muslim world in, in Cairo in, on June 4th, he had announced when he became president he was going to make a major speech to the Islamic world, and he gave it in Cairo on June 4th, and he said several things that were very, well, many things, but several things that were very telling. One was he gave three reasons for the conflict between the West and the Islamic world, and all of them were our fault. He said... The Islamic world is mad at us because of colonialism, the colonial period, because of the Cold War in which the Muslim countries were essentially pawns between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and the rottenness of American pop culture. And he never mentioned the possibility that they might hate us for reasons of their own that have nothing to do with what we have done or not done or can do in the future. But Barack Obama is proceeding along the assumption that this is all our fault and they hate us for things that we have done and if we just change what we're doing, then they will love us. And he's in for a rude awakening, but, you know, there's no talking to the man about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Spencer. Um, at this point... Um, I'd like to uh, just remind us that uh, speakers like Mr. Robert Spencer and other prominent conservative speakers are available through Young America's Foundation's campus lecture program uh, to speak on your own campuses. If you'd like to find out more information, please contact us at yaf.org or 1-800-USA-1776. Uh, Mr. Spencer will be available at noon uh, after our upcoming talk uh, to sign copies of his book, Stealth Jihad. Um, at this point, we're going to be moving immediately to our next speaker, and uh, I'd like to ask Trevor Easton to come up and introduce her.